Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Keisha, and I'm a clinical psychologist and the clinical services manager here at Clinikids. We've had such a huge positive response to this webinar, which I'm guessing means you're all as interested in this topic as we are here at Clinikids. We're so excited to be able to share what we've been doing here at Clinikids with you. Uh, which is very much in line with the topic that Professor Whitehouse will be presenting to you tonight, the future of autism research in Australia. Before we begin, I just want to introduce you all to what Clinikids is about. So Clinikids is part of the Telethon Kids Institute and it's an Australian first research into practice clinic, which means we aim to get interventions out of research papers and into being delivered to children in our clinic. We're really interested in improving outcomes for children with autism and developmental delay in the early intervention space. And we work with children as young as six months right up to 12 years. Um, our clinicians and our researchers work together to identify interventions that are showing good outcomes in the research, and then we implement them in our clinic, measuring the effectiveness. Um, we're really interested in interventions that improve outcomes for the whole family system. And our clinicians and researchers work together to find innovative ways to do this and always ensuring that we're collecting data so we can evidence these interventions. Professor Whitehouse will be discussing some of these autism early interventions as an example of how we have integrated research into practice in our clinic most recently. Uh, we welcome your questions during the presentation, so please post any that you may have by navigating to the right hand corner of your screen. We hope to get through as many as possible, but we'll provide you with a way to contact us following the presentation if you still have questions. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Professor Andrew Whitehouse. Andrew's passion for improving outcomes for children on the autism spectrum, coupled with his desire to see more timely access to up-to-date evidence-based interventions led to the development of Clinikids, which he describes as the meeting place for cutting edge science and clinical innovation. Andrew is personally one of the most passionate advocates for the continual improvement of services for the autism community that I have ever met. And he's super excited to share his presentation with you all tonight, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. So without further ado, thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple of seconds before um, uh, we start, just so we can ensure that um, my slides are on the screen. We've got the thumbs up, so let's get cracking. Thank you so much um, for attending and, and registering. We had over a thousand people um, sign up to attend tonight, and we're really um, very excited. And, and I feel very privileged that you're um, choosing to spend it with us rather than MasterChef, though I'm sure you can um, attach that up a bit later. Um, look, the topic um, of tonight is the uh, future of autism um, intervention in Australia. And it's, it's, a, it's a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. And um, I, what I uh, want to convey to you today is really a collection of things. Firstly, that we have come a long way in our understanding of autism and how we can best support um, kids and adolescents and adults on the spectrum, um, choose what they want for their own lives. And that's really, I think, the goal of our intervention. Um, secondly, there is still so much to do. But thirdly, you, us and all of us are right at the precipice of an exciting time for how we can better support um, uh, these beautiful kids and adolescents and adults. And really, that's what I want to convey today. What we've got, we've got a whole lot of mix of people attending. So we have a lot of clinicians, we have a lot of um, families, um, people on the spectrum, of course, as well as a lot of researchers. So it's going to be tough to meet all of those um, uh, uh, um, points um, through this presentation, but nevertheless, I'm going to do my best. So we'll get cracking. Okay. So um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is really talk about why research. Um, I, I think it's super important that we actually justify why research is so important. Secondly, talk about why, what do we know about autism, and then what we don't know about autism, and really the future of autism intervention research, particularly as we do it through Clinikids. What I really want you to think about as we go along is how this applies to you and your life, and particularly how you can get involved um, and uh, to, to this very exciting time uh, where we're at with regards to um, uh, the journey of autism research and clinical management. 
Okay, so let's talk about what is autism research. I think it's really important to understand um, uh, why we do research. I'm one of those awful people who questions everything. Um, my wife um, uh, tells me that uh, uh, very charmingly that um, it was very endearing um, when we were dating. It's hell when we're married, um, and so nevertheless, I still do it. Um, so we question: What do I? Why do we do research? Number one is understanding. Um, it, it's really important that we do start to understand who kids on the autism spectrum are. It's not about what they are, it's about who is this beautiful little human being in front of me um, and what is his or her strengths and challenges. That for me is one of the core aspects of why we do autism research. Secondly, it's about explaining. Um, we can't pretend that trying to understand why a child or an adolescent or adult has developed differently is important. It certainly is, it's important to me, it's important to that individual and their family. And that to me is a really important aspect of why we do what we do. Third, it's discovery, and this is super exciting to me. What can we do differently to help every child on the spectrum reach their potential? I'm not interested in how we can do things the same. We know what happens when we do things the same, and we've made significant and enormous strides. But for me, it's about what can we do differently? Small tweaks, large tweaks, and sometimes that's bumpy, but definitely at the end of the process, we better support kids and adolescents on the spectrum. So, why research? Well, um, um, the simple fact is it absolutely genuinely improves lives. And of course, we're in a bit of a bloody weird time at the moment with COVID, and we see how important medical research is to um, our lives in a very acute way. There are a few examples that I like to bring up um, um, that really remind me why research is important. The first one I think is a really clear example, and, and, and this is um, a particular form of leukaemia called um, ALL, or acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. Now, in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s, the vast majority of kids uh, with leukaemia um, didn't survive. Um, uh, now, through medical research, now uh, more than 90%, not just survive, but live long and dignified lives. That's an enormous achievement, all put down to medical research. One of my favourites is polio. Uh, of course, we know the story of polio way back to the, um, um, the 19th century. 350,000 new cases just in 1985, that's all around the world. But due to a concerted medical research campaign, very much supported, I must add, by Rotary um, uh, and Rotary Australia and, and the Rotary Clubs of Western Australia have been very prominent in this, um, down to 22 new cases, only 22 new cases um, a mere 32 uh, years later. That's an extraordinary achievement. And without a doubt, my favourite. Um, is in vitro fertilisation and artificial reproductive techniques. Um, I'm not too sure if you knew, maybe you did, but one in 25 births in Australia nowadays um, are through IVF or an ART. Um, that's an extraordinary figure. And can you just imagine the amount of happiness that that has, been, has created um, in Australia and around the world? Um, that is just an extraordinary thing. And, and when I think about why it happened, it happened due to medical research. It makes our lives better, makes our lives happier, and it makes all of us stronger as a community. So, let's talk about autism. Now, um, uh, you probably get a little bit jaded when you listen to the um, uh, media reports on the news or on the um, radio, and and all of all, you hear this wonderful breakthrough that um, might might or may not have occurred, uh, occurred, and then right at the end, there's always more research is needed, and that actually annoys me a little bit as well because um, uh, uh, of course what we do want to provide is significant advances for you. Um, nevertheless, what I want to do is actually just say how much research um, has advanced our understanding, our explanation and our discovery around autism during my lifetime. And I put that um, up there. I actually forgot it was in there, but it's in there. I'm um, just to show you that once um, I did have a fresh face and I didn't have a five o'clock shadow. Um, I don't know what's happened to that since, but that was what that was when um, I'm talking about now in the 1980s. So um, number one. What we've uh, discovered more about autism research since the 80s, uh, about autism since the 80s, is that for starters, autism isn't one condition. Back in the 1980s, we thought that autism was one condition with a very sim uh, simple sim uh, symptom profile. Um, we thought that autism must be diagnosed during early childhood, and to get a diagnosis of autism, you had to have significant disability. We had a very constrained view of what autism is. Through significant amounts of research, we actually understand autism so much better now. We know that autism isn't one condition, it's many conditions, um, and is often associated with other um, challenges uh, along the way, and I'll get into that. 
Um, autism can be diagnosed at any time in the life, and I think that's a wonderful um, step forward that we've made. And of course, the symptoms vary in their severity. And in fact, the one thing that we know about autism, in fact, everyone knows, is that um, the symptoms vary very significantly between not just the uh, indi different individuals, but in the same individuals over time. So this is how we viewed autism back in the 1980s, what we called the so-called triad of impairments. I haven't said that word for a while. Uh, social difficulties, communication difficulties, and and repetitive behaviours. That's the symptoms, the behavioural symptoms we used to diagnose autism according to. This is how we diagnose autism now. Rather than a triad, we have a dyad of difficulties. So that's social communication, interaction difficulties, and restricted and repetitive behaviours. But importantly, that's the core of why we diagnose autism, but we absolutely know that there are other things that come along. For example, intellectual disability in a significant proportion of, of kids and adults. Movement difficulties is a really prominent one and often very hidden. We're very um, um, keen on monitoring that within clinic kids. Um, physical health conditions, of course, we, we, we do see um, uh, increased rates of certain physical health conditions, as well as mental health conditions as well. That's a big one. And we know that more than 50% of adults on the spectrum do have a comorbid mental health condition. So our understanding about autism has changed dramatically over the years. Um, why is that important? Well, it's really important because once we start to un understand something, we can actually start to appreciate it. And that's something so important to, to me um, and, and the colleagues that I work with. Uh, what we were working with in the 1980s, we weren't understanding anything. We were actually understanding something that didn't exist. Now what we understand is a fuller appreciation of autism. And now that helps us to actually not focus on disorder, but actually the individuals. Um, and that, to me, is one of the most significant advances. Um, secondly, um, we understand far more about the causal pathways to autism. Now, in the 1980s, we know that um, uh, uh, we often said that autism, we don't really understand why children develop a little bit differently and get a diagnosis of autism. Then came the genetic revolution in the late 90s and early noughties, and we were searching for the gene for autism, a single gene that would cause the brain to develop differently and children to have autism. Um, then uh, we were looking for the one difference in the brain, the one neuro difference that was responsible for why, for the behaviours that we see, then we diagnose with autism. And of course, there was going to be a connection between that gene and that brain difference. Of course, we know it's very, very different now, and that has happened through an extraordinary um, uh, explosion in research. I've said this statistic quite a bit, but. Um, when um, the Human Genome Project was um, sequencing every little base, those A, C, T and Gs um, in your DNA sequence, all three billion of them, it took about 10 years, um, between seven and 10 years, and billions and billions of dollars. Um, due to medical research advances, we can now do that overnight and for about $1,000, get three billion pieces of information in your DNA. It's an extraordinary advance. We now know, of course, that autism has a genetic origin. It's very clearly there's a genetic origin there, but it's not one condition. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of different causal pathways that can lead a child to develop autism. And of course, there's no one neuro difference that characterizes all kids and adults on the autism spectrum. The genes express in the brain in a very different way between different individuals. So let's talk about genetic and brain differences. And we know, for example, that um, genetic differences are caused by um, a couple of different ways. Number one, a rare variant. So this is when the sperm and the egg meet. Um, um, a new genetic difference is, is formed that wasn't in the parents. Um, and that, that evolves over time. We often see that in a significant proportion of um, a significant minority of, of kids. Um, but mostly we see what we call common variation that may lead the brain to develop it differently. Now, common variation is basically a genetic variants that we all have in our DNA. But when five, six, seven of particular genetic variants cluster in a particular individual as they're developing, their brain is developing, it can make the brain develop a di bit differently. And that's what we call common variation. We know that um, um, occurs in a significant minority of kids on the spectrum as well. If we're talking about brain differences, what we do know is that it's highly, highly, highly unlikely that there is a difference in the structure or function of one particular region in the brain that um, leads to why um, uh, are the autistic uh, symptoms that we see. We know it's highly unlikely. What we do know is that there is gathering evidence that actually for some 
kids and adults are all on the spectrum, um, is the way that the brain communicates with each other, uh, with different parts of um, the brain, that might actually lead to some of the development differences that we see, particularly early on in development. But again, there's still much that we need to understand. So for example, um, I've said that um, uh, uh, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of causal pathways that may lead a child to develop autism. This is just a few. There might be just simple things. There might be a simple genetic factor that does lead to a difference in the way the brain develops. That's a very small number of um, children and adults on the spectrum. More likely, it's going to be things such as this. So genetic, fa genetic factors that influence how um, the, the levels of hormone in the bloodstream or how the body uptakes the hormones, which leads to particular types of inflammation, which might affect how the brain develops. Or it might be genetic factors that influence the bacteria um, in the gut. And of course, we know the gut and the brain are very connected, which might in impact upon an unknown um, factor and lead to the brain to develop differently. Or it might be something in between. Basically, there are hundreds um, of different ways that we know may lead the brain to develop differently. Now, when I talk about this, people go, God, isn't that disheartening? And, and I just couldn't think um, any more different. I, I actually think this is entirely liberating. And the, the reason is this is because it really helps us focus our minds not on the molecules um, that lead to the uh, bacteria, that lead to other things, that lead to other things that might influence the biology. It actually helps us focus on the humans. It helps us go, hang on, the brain has developed differently for a, for a particular reason. What we need to focus on is right now the human in front of us and how we can best support that individual reach their full potential. So third advance is the clinical pathway. Um, uh, th this to me is something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, I think that our uh, clinical pathway has served us extremely well over time but it's probably a little bit out of date and that we need to shake it up quite a bit. And that's what we're trying to do a lot here at Clinic Kids. And I can't wait actually to get to the second part of the talk where I uh, explain how. Um, number one, um, uh, in, in the 1980s, um, autism was a very mysterious condition. Um, uh, and it was very rare, as we know. Um, um, uh, and we often adopted a wait and see approach. A child's developing differently. Mm, maybe the child is just a, um, a, a late bloomer and they might uh, develop uh, uh, more typically. Um, and so we'll just wait for a little bit. Um, that then often led to inconsistent diagnostic methods, which we know happens all across Australia. Um, and then beyond there, there, there's little clinical and personal support. And that was in the 1980s. And I, and I say four services only. This is a reflection of a one particular state in Western Australia, where um, way back when, when I was um, starting in, there were really only four services um, in the whole of the state um, that um, individuals could go to receive uh, appropriate intervention. Um, that was a crazy of affairs and I'm glad to see that it's changed. Now, um, what do we know? Well, we know absolutely that before we diagnose autism, um, there are often early um, signs that a child's development has wandered a little bit off course um, um, prior to the diagnosis, often within the second six months of that first year of life. Now we have consistent diagnostic practices through the National Guideline for Autism Diagnosis and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, after that, there is a swift pathway to intervention. Um, there's no lag, um, typically, uh, and uh, uh, often it's off, uh, people go off into very high quality service providers, many of whom are watching tonight. That is a huge advance to have a clinical community that is very well trained out there to receive um, and, and support you along your journey. Um, just to give you an example of the diagnosis, one of the advances that I think has been quite important in, in, in the clinical pathway, and that's in di the diagnostic methods. Now, um, in 2015, we conducted a study, Lauren Taylor led this study, um, that actually identified that in Australia, there's huge variability in how we diagnose autism um, between the states and also within the states. Um, and we know that happens, and we all know that that happens. Um, this is really the first study to actually quantify that. Um, we also know there's a heavy reliance on diagnostic based support and funding um, um, and that that is what it is and fam and there are systems that do need to do that for certain reasons. We all know it's not ideal, um, but nevertheless, that's the reality. Um, this the, the, that state of affairs emphasizes really two points. Number one um, is that we need consistent diagnostic practices, which is equitable for everyone. Um, and then we also need to push forward for a needs-based diagnostic, a needs-based um, system rather than system based on diagnosis, the presence or absence of a diagnosis. 
In um, 2016 or 17, I believe, um, the, the Federal Minister approached myself and um, um, uh, uh, Dr John Ray, thus Epen, Margot Pryor and Kaya Evans to develop a national guideline for autism assessment and diagnosis. And it was really based on that rationale that through the NDIS, we're working towards a national system now rather than a state-based system. And it's really important that we start to talk a common language. And those were the, um, uh, uh, the, the points that we were um, given to try and meet, um, which is a rigorous and accurate diagnostic uh, a guideline that is rigorous and accurate. It identifies strengths and support needs, flexible for individuals and contexts, feasible to administer and has to be acceptable. It was a really steep ask that we were asked to do. We undertook a two year process um, from August 2016 um, all the way through to um, the late 2018, where we really went out for a large consultation process about what is important in autism um, diagnosis. In fact, the, di the assessment and diagnosis of any children with neurodevelopmental differences um, and what do families need, what do clinicians need, what do services need, um, and how can we make that into an acceptable and a feasible protocol. Um, the National Guideline, which was published in 2018, is a really important document uh, that hopefully helps us all speak with a uh, common language. And I really encourage you to download that. Um, the Diagnostic Guidelines provides detailed guidance on all of these things that I um, have put up there. And that's really um, an important um, thing that we uh, have detailed guidance on who collects information, what is collected, where, how and when. All of those things are really important that we do that in a standardised way. Importantly, the Diagnostic Guideline does provide important information about um, uh, things such that, that we know can influence um, are all some of the challenges in diagnosis, such as the age at which an individual presents, um, intellectual and communication capacity, gender. We know that females often present different, differently um, than males um, on the spectrum. And of course, all of those other things about how do we reach everybody in Australia so it's equitable. Um, in 2018, that was approved by the NHMRC Council, which is the body in Australia that, that endorses um, a, a, a guideline. Um, it was launched by the Commonwealth Ministers for Health and Social Services, and um, there is currently a nationwide implementation plan being formulated by the Department of Social Services. Now, the reason that I um, put this up there is, uh, is to show you a, an example of how research and cooperation between all of the people who are viewing um, this, this webinar today um, can truly make differences. This wasn't us um, um, that did this. Yes, we drove it, but it wasn't us that did it. It was everyone who cooperated to say this is a problem and we need to fix it. And really, that's what I want you to get out of today's webinar. Finally, how else have we pushed forward the autism research or the autism agenda? Number one um, is, uh, is talking about the 1980s and certainly autism was very unknown. Um, and really up until Rain Man, this is one of those things where pop culture can actually make a significant difference in how we view um, um, uh, all of us within the community. I and mean, that was in the mid to late 80s, I believe. Um, certainly in the um, 80s, we focused on a cure. There were all sorts of bodies out there, Cure Autism Now, um, all, all sorts of um, bodies out there really focusing on how do we cure kids. Um, and um, that, of course, had some significantly negative impacts on people. Um, there was also little focus beyond childhood. Those four services I mentioned previously really maintain, in WA maintain a focus um, on kids. And, and um, uh, there was an absolutely metaphorical cliff that people fell off. I'm not saying that it's not there right now, but certainly that's reduced. What do we know now? Well, firstly, autism is widely known. And one thing that I'd really uh, implore you to um, understand, and this is due to uh, AMAZE, um, the Victorian, one of the Victorian um, advocacy organisations, they found in the survey that one in four Australians has a relative on the autism spectrum. Tell your, politi your local politician about that. Um, um, we focus on the human um, ra uh, rather than anything else, rather than the cure. We focus on the human in front of in, in front of us and how we can maximise that person's potential to make decisions over their own lives. That's really the goal of what we're about. And of course, we understand far more about autism beyond childhood, in childhood including importantly, that we must focus on it. So. These are the advances that we've made, according to me, over the past um, 20 or 30 years. Oh God, almost 40 years um, over my life so span. Um, and, and they, um, while it might not be the same as reducing polio by 350,000 um, uh, uh, people, nevertheless, I can tell you in the lives of many families, this has made all the difference. The, the experiences that we go through now, 
albeit not perfect, are light years better than our forebears. And that is a really important thing that we can build upon. So this is where I turn um, uh, happiness in, into a little bit of doom and gloom. Um, does it mean that the world is all full of sunshine and lollipops? No, well, it, it, it quite clearly isn't. And, and that's a really important thing to say. We are doing a lot better than we did, um, but we're certainly not doing as good as we, get, as we possibly can. Now, what I do is I put those things up there because I want to provide you with an example of how um, um, we can change things. It only means what I've just shown you, that we have changed things previously and we can do it even more now. And that's what I want to focus the rest of the talk on. Okay, so what don't we know? Well, the questions are really unlimited. Really, really unlimited. Um, and, uh, and I just uh, put a few up there, but you could have many, many more up there. Now, the, the thing is, of course, is that um, how do we then focus on which questions that we want to answer? Now, we all have questions and every one of us has overlapping questions and different questions. But the, the, I want you to understand the way that I develop priorities. And this is, um, I think, important for research as well as for clinicians and families. We all have far too much on our plate. I think COVID's actually taught us that, that actually a quieter life can be a nicer life at times. Um, but nevertheless, we do have all too much on our, uh, our plate. And it's important that we actually do prioritise what we focus on. And so how do I prioritise? Well, I develop principles. And it's really important to do principles because every day we face tough decisions about how we choose to spend our most important commodity, and that's our time. Um, and these are the principles um, uh, that uh, influence me and how we make decisions about what research um, um, we take forward in the limited time that we all have. And I think it's important also for clinical decision making as well as um, uh, uh, how we make decisions within our families. And I'd just like to acknowledge um, uh, the Australian Autism Research Council who really helped develop these principles. Number one is impact. Um, the research priorities that we have really need to target areas that will create the most meaningful impact for people on the spectrum and their families. There's a lot of areas out there that will create impact. and We need to rank those according to um, uh, the people who matter the most, and that's you. Second, focus on the individuals, the priorities, that we focus on have to assist people um, on the spectrum to discover what they want for their own lives and support them to achieve their own goals. That for me is ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, it's not as easily encapsulated as in um, helping children develop 20 words, 40 words, 100 words, go to the toilet, um, um, sit and eat. Um, it's not as easy to encapsulate in that, but really when we think about it, that's what we want. We want to help people develop autonomy over their own lives so they can make their own choices. Number three, we have to be inclusive of everyone. Too much, we focus on a narrow um, brand or band of people, and we need to be as, uh, as broad and inclusive as possible because everybody is created equal, and that's what we want to focus on. Okay, so we develop principles. The second thing is that we must ask you, and that's the clinicians, that's the families, that's the researchers, as to what is important for you and your life um, right now and into the future. But also for families, what do you think is important for future generations? What are the things that you felt like you didn't have that you would like future generations to have? And that's actually um, what, uh, what a number of organisations have done. So th this, um, these questions that I put up previously, this was actually developed by Autistica, which is a UK advocacy um, uh, organisation. And these were the priorities that they came up with. In Australia, we recently undertook a similar process. This was through the Autism Cooperative Research Centre um, and the Australian Autism Research Council, which is also under the Autism CRC. It's a huge consultation of research interests and priorities. Many of you would have completed that um, questionnaire. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge um, all of the um, uh, uh, ARC members, the, the council members, particularly um, Dr. Wen Lawson, who was my um, co-chair of, of that particular um, process. This is essentially um, what uh, people came up with with regards to um, their most important research uh, uh, priorities. And you keep in mind that we had a lot of clinicians, we had a lot of families and a lot of researchers. So really, um, um, and of course, many individuals on the spectrum, about 200 individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, we asked people, uh, we gave them a hypothetical $7 um, and they could spend that $7 on any or all of these 
um, uh, research priorities. And this is essentially how those seven dollars panned out. The majority of, of uh, sorry, the largest priority was around education research, uh, health and wellbeing research, and then communication research. But every aspect there um, was really represented. So these were the 10 research priorities that were developed by the Autism CRC. Um, and um, for me, they're pretty much spot on what I see and what I hear from you um, all the time. And um, so that's running, running from health and wellbeing, um, which uh, is it's just, I cannot underscore um, how important that is. Um, definitely increasing um, people's uh, 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 ability to live independently is really, really important. At the same time, with our health and well-being, we don't even have that. So it has to be a prime focus. Um, and you can see them there. And um, just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and we can certainly, you can certainly go back and spend a bit of time on that. So we've developed our research priorities. Well, what do we do now? And, and re really, what we do now is we start. And that's the only way to, to um, um, get through this is we have to start. And that's what we've decided to do. Um, and through clinic is here. The one I want to focus on today is communication. Um, um, way back when I um, uh, trained as a speech pathologist, I think mo most of the speeches would disown me now, um, but I all have maintained a, um, a, a focus and an interest in communication um, ever since. And look, the reality is this, is that 50% of kids um, on the autism spectrum are not verbally fluent at school entry and um, around 30% um, of individuals on the autism spectrum have minimally verbal language um, and that means uh, the ability to use uh, about 20 words in a you know flexible way um, that to me is insane uh, it is just crazy that th this has become the state of affairs and it's not through the enormous efforts of course of clinicians families and of course the individual on the spectrum themselves develop that language but what we need to do is we need to find new ways to improve that and I know so many people are and that's really what, that was one aspect um, that led us to um, um, Clinic Kids. It's not just about communication, but the whole of that child's development. And what I want to do now is to go into some of the ways that we're trying to shake up the clinical pathway to support um, our kids and families on their early journey. Okie dokie. Okay, so what is Clinic Kids? Um, well, Clinic Kids is quite um, simply a clinical centre of excellence. Um, we developed it uh, mainly because we identified very early on that there is a lot of research knowledge out there um, that is not getting all the way through to the clinic. Now, th that is most certainly not the fault of clinicians. Clinicians lead an extraordinarily busy existence. Um, it's absolutely the fault of navel gazing researchers like myself who need to be the change that we see, which is taking research to the clinic rather than clinic reaching back to the research. And that's what we want to develop with Clinic Kids. And that's a um, center of excellence that translates the latest research findings to deliver um, gold standard interventions. So intervention that we know is effective um, based on the scientific evidence. We also wanted to provide a center for innovation. We know that lots of people in the community have lots of ideas. We have no, let me assure you that all of the good ideas that we have had have not been from me, they've been from you, the community. And that is the, a really important place that we develop a safe place where innovations can occur. Um, and thirdly, that we don't want to hold on to the knowledge that we develop. We want everyone else to have it. And so we want to train and upskill the clinical community to have the um, research knowledge that we have. Um, or, and the innovations that we've developed. And that's a really clear mantra of what we've developed. We're very lucky enough to have beautiful facilities. Um, this is um, for our Eastern State and uh, Kiwi viewers. Um, this is in Perth, Western Australia, um, but certainly we do a lot of telehealth. So um, this is the sort of map that I like to put out. Then, and I'm gonna talk about early intervention now. I am gonna reach into um, intervention beyond the early years, um, um, right towards the end, but for the next little bit, I'm gonna be talking about early intervention, which is really the first six, seven, eight years of life. Um, this um, I'm gonna put up now is a bit of a caricature of what the early clinical pathway is. Bear in mind, it is a caricature, but at the same time, I would hear um, these stories day in, day out, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Okay. So someone um, had identified something uh, a little bit different about the way that child is developing very early on in life. Um, maybe mum, dad, child health nurse, auntie, uncle, friend. Um, uh, but because our clinical systems aren't necessarily geared up to accept referrals for kids so young, 
Um, um, these kids often bounce from health service to health service and um, uh, clinician to clinician until they eventually receive a diagnosis at around age three. We know that the median age um, of diagnosis of autism in Australia is about four and a half. So really the majority of kids have been diagnosed between about two and seven years of age in Australia. After diagnosis, of course, the world opens up for intervention and that's really where intervention starts in earnest. Now, um, I, there are two aspects of this clinical pathway um, that I've identified over the years and, and really you have as well because you have told me this time and time again. Um, number one is that too often we do miss those early signs of autism and um, we don't listen to parents as much as we could um, in accepting that there is something de developing a little bit differently about kids and how then do we respond to that in a prompt and timely manner. Um, um, the second thing um, after diagnosis is I think that we still have a little bit of a muddle in the way that we um, uh, approach intervention and how we best personalise and tailor intervention approaches to different um, kids. And so that's what I want to talk to you about for the next little bit. Let's talk firstly about the missed bit. Okay, the missed bit um, is really talking to you about um, um, why we're missing kids. So we know that the behaviour, the science has told us quite categorically that, but that we can identify early signs um, of kids that are predictive of an autism diagnosis early in life. Um, um, these uh, signs typically emerge during the second half of the first year of life or in that sort of um, 12 to 18 month period. Um, what we did um, as a first port of call is we started to under, uh, understand that, okay, if we are, can identify these kids um, at this very young age, um, we need to actually develop interventions that are suited to infants. Of course, the majority of our interventions are suited to um, older kids. So what can we do? Now, in this regard, um, um, we commenced a study called the ACES study, which was developing, sorry, which was trialling um, a, a new intervention for, uh, for kids um, um, from nine to 14 months of age, was showing early signs of autism. The infant intervention really worked on a pillar of three things. We used video feedback um, techniques to help parents understand um, the, the social and communication cues that their babies are giving them. Um, um, we did this through 10 home-based sessions um, and we really focused on how families can help understand and recognise the infant's behaviour and how might it might best be um, uh, that parents can respond um, to those kids' needs. Um, the, we did a large randomised control trial and, and I promise I'm not going to bore you with a great deal of um, science in this talk, but, but what I want you to show is this graph and, and, and essentially this is what's called a forest plot. Now all you need to know is that um, or if those, um, those bars, those horizontal uh, bars, the dots in the middle, if they're to the right of the dotted line, um, that means that there is a positive effect of the treatment intervention. Um, if that, those um, bars overlap, with the dotted line, that means that actually there was no difference between the intervention and the control intervention that the um, families let, um, uh, received. So there was 100 kids in this study recruited between nine and 14 months of age, um, and uh, the intervention went for six months. Now the bottom panel there, um, where it says VAB socialization, VAB's communication, et cetera, these are a whole lot of parent reported measures of socialization and communication. Um, what you'll see there is that there were significant improvements in these kids um, particularly how parents were perceiving and understanding their communication. That's a really important finding that we had. Um, just to acknowledge all of those partners that were participated in that um, uh, study, the ACES trial. And we've now fo um, followed these kids up to three years of age and we're about to see um, how, um, whether those uh, improvements in their development were sustained across the first three years of life. So this gives us really great encouragement that not only can we identify infants early in life, but we can actually by interventions that can make a meaningful, tangible um, difference uh, in families' lives. Um, but then we got started thinking, okay, we're talking about infants. Um, can we even look a little bit earlier? And of course, um, infancy is certainly not the start of a kid's life. And we know that so much happens in those first six months of life, even in the womb. A lot of my um, uh, original research was about how babies develop within the womb. Um, but of course, in the first six months of life, there is so much that happens. Babies pop out of the womb ready to communicate with you. And so what happens if we could actually help families understand their baby's communication signals right from the start of life? and then provide um, the most rich social and communication environment right from the start of life. 
And that's what we did. We developed an intervention and a program for families who have a family history of autism. So we know that that newborn baby is at an increased chance of going on to develop autism. And we developed an intervention um, for those families right from the very get go. Um, that's what we did. Again, we're focusing on those same aspects. We're using video um, feedback mechanisms, which, we're, which is essentially videoing um, the, the baby into um, interacting with the parent and providing the parent with a whole lot of feedback about where those communication signals are coming from that baby and how they can pick up on them and respond in the most sensitive way. It's just a, an amazing thing when families understand right from the first few days of life how that baby's communicating with them through all their nonverbal cues and even their verbal cues. It's a super exciting thing. So this is the intervention that we developed. Um, it starts in the antenatal period where we provide families um, with a seminar about all of the wonderful things that babies do when they pop out of the womb. And then we have a whole lot of um, face to face in uh, program um, sessions after all the way through to six to eight months of age. So this is actually a study that's going right on at the moment and I really wanted to show it to you today so you can understand about it and get excited about it too because it's not just us that's doing it, really we're doing it with you, the community. So the research is recruiting pregnant women where the growing baby has a family history of autism or ADHD or any other neurodevelopmental disorder, it could be an existing child or an extended family member. Um, we have sites in Perth and Melbourne um, and we're actively recruiting now for, for people to um, involved in this study and receive the intervention. If you'd like to be involved, please do um, uh, uh, um, email that uh, email address. And again, I'll um, put this up at the end. So that's the missed bit. We absolutely think that intervention doesn't need to start a diagnosis. We can identify children who have an increased chance early on, both through their early signs, but then also through the um, um, their family history. And so we've developed infant and baby interventions. And we're um, absolutely committed to testing them. Second bit I want to talk to you about is how I think intervention is still a little muddled. Now, it's not lost on me, and I know it's not lost on any clinician out there or researcher out there at all, that um, the point of diagnosis is not just an enormously um, uh, a life changing moment, it's also a hugely um, confusing moment. And um, we, uh, I'm talking about the clinical and research community, often don't make it easy for you because there is all sorts of options out there. Um, and um, for all of those questions that I have on the right, and we need to do better in providing you those options. Now, of course, there are many different intervention approaches out there. I put up three there with probably the best evidence. Of course, behavioural approaches we know about, um, um, developmental approaches, and then um, this more recent advent, which is um, NDBIs, Naturalistic Developmental Behavioural Interventions, which is a really fancy um, and really mind-numbingly boring word um, for combining both behavioural and developmental approaches. Now, um, just to give you an illustration of the confusion that um, people like me provide you, Look at all of those acronyms. Now I could rattle them off right right now, but you as a family who, and I bet you could as well, um, but um, you as a family who's first into the, into the world of autism, um, that's not kind and we need to do a lot better. Now, of course, all of these approaches have a degree of, uh, of evidence for what we call efficacy. That means that they can improve developmental outcomes in kids on the spectrum. But the challenge is that these studies that show that there is efficacy, they leave one of the most major questions unanswered and most importantly, probably the question that I think is the holy grail of autism research. And this is this one, which interventions are the most effective for which child and of course the family and at which time of their life? At the moment, we do not have a good understanding of that, which means that when there's a little child um, and family in front of us, we I can talk about generalities in terms of what intervention is yeah, uh, uh, efficacious. And I said there is developmental, behavioural and NDBIs, but um, we cannot at the moment, um, um, with an evidence base behind us, tailor the intervention to your particular child and family. This is probably the corest part of the clinic it's gone. So, there are two interventions that um, particularly catch my eye at this particular point um, for showing quite good evidence through randomised control trials, um, which is the gold standard of evidence we use in health and medicine for showing um, good efficacy. Number one is a PACT was developed in the UK, again, it's an acronym, Preschool Autism Communication Therapy, and it's from the Developmental School of Therapies, and it really has good evidence for promoting child communication. The second one is JASPER. 
Jasper um, is around um, uh, is, is one of those approaches that combines developmental and behavioural approaches. Um, it really focuses on joint attention again with the idea of promoting social communication. Now, both of these interventions have very good evidence from randomised control trials to, to, to determine efficacy. But again, um, what we don't know is which of these interventions is going to be best for your child or a particular child. Um, the way that we scientifically test therapies, and it's really important, again, I'm not going to bore you with this, but the way that we scientifically test therapies is we do randomised control trials, which I've mentioned already. And just to give you an example of what these are, we get around 100 kids on the autism spectrum, um, let's just say 100 kids for argument's sake, and then we randomise them. I go to my computer and my computer spits out a number and it tells me that a child should receive either therapy one or therapy two. And that what we do is we um, follow the child over a period of six months receiving either of those therapies, and then we compare um, those two groups, therapy one and therapy two. And the idea is to understand which group might have improved in, say, communication ability um, more than the other group. Now, this is a really good scientific test of determining which therapy is best. But the important thing to understand is that it actually only tells us what is good for the average child because we're averaging across 50 kids for each group. But of course, in clinical practice, we're not interested in the average child. We're interested in your child, what is best for your child. And so we need to find new ways of doing things. And that's what we're doing at Clinikids. Um, and just that final point there, it assumes that every child responds the same way to a given therapy. We know that's not the case because every human is different. So what if we tried something different? And that's what we really wanted to do um, in this new trial. And this is the new study that we're doing. It's called the Preschool Autism Therapy Study. And it's really um, a clinical practice research that seeks to understand which of these two therapies is most effective for which child. And as I said, that to me is the holy grail of what we want to do. And all I want to do here, this is a very, very complicated thing, but all that I'm showing you is that actually we can develop new ways of doing our trials so we understand which way to go. So we still have those children right at the start that we randomised to receive one of two therapies. That's right on the left-hand side. The children, I go to my computer and children, the computer tells me um, a child is going to receive either PAC therapy or JASPER therapy. But then at about three, week, three months of age, uh, three months um, into the trial, so it's about week 12, we identify which kids are responding really well to the therapy and which kids might not be responding. And so those kids that, that are, respond, uh, are not responding as quickly as, as possible, we actually say, hmm, Okay, just like we do in clinical practice. Hmm. Okay, maybe we should persist for another three months to see if um, the child is just a bit of a slow responder to this therapy. Or maybe we should actually switch it up. Should we intensify this therapy because that's what this particular child needs. Now through this therapy method, uh, sorry, this, this trial method, we're actually going to be able to get to the very heart of the question of not whether PACT or JASPER is effective, we know they are effective on, on average to improving developmental outcomes, but which child um, is PACT most, most effective for, which child is JASPER most effective for, that is going to be fabulous. Okay, again, um, I'm trying to get you excited about this study because it is super excited and um, I'm not too sure whether that um, um, pegs me as a little bit sad or a little bit um, uh, nerdy, probably both. Um, what we're doing is we're going to be recruiting families for this um, um, study. Um, it's actually children um, one year and six months of age, sorry, that's a bit of an error there, but all the way through to four years of an 11 months and, and we're going to be commencing in mid-2020 and this study based out of Perth. And so if you have a child that might um, be eligible either through um, if you're a clinician for, through a referral or if um, they're your family, please do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so um, these uh, families can be uh, taking part in a really important scientific development. Um, importantly, we'll also be offering these therapies um, for kids not in, in the trial as well. Okay, so beyond early intervention, and I'm going to wrap up soon. And I really look forward to taking, up, um, taking your questions. Um, as I've mentioned, that we really need to break down why we're doing intervention. Um, certainly, we do have micro goals, things such as can I um, uh, have get my child to go to the toilet, for example? Can I um, have my child um, or this child learn to um, say 20 words um, functionally and flexibly? Uh, can um, I have my child um, go to a play group and be sustained at that play group where I'm not called um, um, to come and pick them up? All of these are the micro goals. Ultimately, what we're trying to achieve um, is to help and assist people on the spectrum to discover what they want for their own lives. 
um, and really supporting them to achieve their own goals. And that, of course, goes beyond early intervention. I wanted to include this slide just so you recognise, um, uh, and, and, and just so I recognise, that uh, early intervention doesn't have to come in the form, oh sorry, intervention doesn't have to come in the form of early intervention. Intervention is across all of our lives, all of the time. And so to, to achieve that goal, it's about promoting health. It's, a, it's about helping our school systems who do a bloody good job under tough circumstances. They don't always get it right, but they do their best. Um, employment, helping um, uh, jo uh, employers become skilled um, in, in accepting um, um, fair, uh, kids on the uh, adults on the spectrum and actually how adults on the spectrum can enrich their workplaces. Um, it's also things such as built environment, family and care support, and of course, living and housing. We need to get better at that. All of that is intervention that we need to focus on. So. For a summary, um, we've made significant strides um, in our understanding um, or, of autism. I hope that I've convinced you of that. While it might not have a headline figure like polio, um, the Rotary has been fantastic in that again. Um, um, uh, what, uh, what, what I hope I've convinced is that <clears throat> the uh, advances are nonetheless um, as dramatic, um, albeit be it with a bit of nuance. It doesn't mean that things are perfect. It just means that we've improved things before and we can bloody well do it again. Clinic Kids um, is um, our way of trying to um, shift things forward again. Um, the foundation of it is the gold standard evidence-based intervention, but of course a network of wonderful colleagues, of wonderful community um, colleagues um, and um, families um, who help and support us to achieve these aims for the good um, of all of our community. Um, I've mentioned two of the innovations that we're doing, baby and infant interventions and personalised clinical pathways. There are more, of course, these are the two that I wanted to highlight in the very short time that we had. Um, just before I finish, I thought I'd give a, a plug for um, uh, one of the books um, that I wrote. Um, this is um, basically me having a great deal of fun um, writing a book about myths um, and uh, of pregnancy and childhood. Um, it's uh, I, I had a great deal of fun writing. And if you'd like to know about um, some of the science behind some of the myths that are out there about pregnancy and childhood, just Google that and you can find the book. I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I'm here in front of you today, but there's a huge amount that goes on behind the scenes um, to make this work. Can I also just acknowledge our um, colleagues and collaborators, and that includes you, um, um, uh, the families out there without whom we couldn't do it. Thank you to all of the um, um, supporters there. And um, um, I'm now going to answer some questions um, for you. Um, and so please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, but if you'd like to get in touch with me um, or any of us, please um, um, give us an email on the Clinic Kids um, email there, as well as um, uh, you can hit us up on the um, Facebook page as well. Okay, so thank you very much for that. What I'm gonna do is if I can do this, I'm gonna go to the Q&A panel. Um, now, what um, um, we have is we have a whole lot of um, questions um, there. We um, are going to go extend beyond the hour. Of course, we know your time is extremely valuable and I thank you for spending it with us. Um, if you'd like to stay on, we'll probably go to about quarter past the hour. Please do hang on for the question um, uh, and answer session. Um, if you don't uh, and, and can't, um, thank you so much um, for um, coming, but please do um, uh, hit us up um, through it via the email. But here's the first question, which is great. Um, uh, this comes from um, someone who's asked about um, the diagnosis of girls and um, we don't have consistent di early diagnosis of girls. Um, that's a really good question. What we certainly do know is that autism presents quite differently, particularly in the early years of life um, for males and females. And we have actually think right now that um, the original four males for every female that is diagnosed, which was the male-female ratio, is incorrect. And that some of that is driven because our diagnostic systems are focused on males rather than females, or at least the male presentation of autism. And what we we're very keen to do through the National Diagnostic Guidelines is actually highlight that being the case. And there's a big long section on gender um, and the particular ways in which um, males and, and and also transgender, I should um, add, but particularly we focus on particular symptoms and how that can differ between males and females. So I really do um, recommend that you um, take a look at that um, diagnostic guideline. If you could Google that, you should find it. Okay, next question. Um, all right, here we go. Um, does the um, diagnostic standards process um, uh, cover adults? Yes, it absolutely does. Again, there's a section on age and how um, uh, age um, um, can actually um, uh, change the way that symptoms present over time. Um, so I would absolutely recommend again that you uh, download that and take a look. Um, 
do we offer training for family as well as clinicians? We absolutely offer training for family, so please do get in contact. Um, what's the percentage of other siblings um, having autism? Really good question. Again, the percentages do change over time. What we do know is that on average, um, the uh, if you have a child with autism, percentage chance um, of the next um, child um, having autism is about 18.7%. I know it's a very exact figure, but I wanted to give you the exact figure. That doesn't mean that you as a person, as, an, as a family, your risk is 18 or your chance is 18.7%. That's just the average. And of course, if you have um, multiple kids on the spectrum, then the, the chances are likely a, a little bit elevated even more, and that's just because of the um, um, the way of the, the patterns of inheritance. Okay, do families need to be living in Perth to be part of research? Absolutely not. The, ba the baby study that I mentioned is taking part um, in um, uh, Melbourne as well as here, but certainly we also do telehealth as well, so I, I'd really encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, what, what are some of the early signs at six months of age and can more information be given to child health nurses to identify these signs? That's such a really good question um, and, I, and I really appreciate that question. My, my personal view is that child health nurses are the most powerful um, uh, uh, ally that we have in improving the clinical um, or, uh, pathway for autism. Um, child health nurses uh, have been in the state budgets, the state run service um, forever, um, and they're likely to be in there for a long time. And, and so the more that we can upskill um, um, uh, child health nurses who are so thirsty for this knowledge, um, um, the better. Some of the early signs, it's really very difficult to talk about this in any specific terms. Um, so um, well, I'd be more than happy to talk to you um, uh, about that via an email. Um, so that's probably the best way that we go. Um, let's go down to, um, since the focus of the Telcom Kids Autism team is on early intervention surface, um, how does clinical services look for kids between seven and 12 years of age? Um, that's a really, really good point. Um, and um, I mentioned that um, the early intervention years are now really considered naught to six um, um, years of age. It probably marries up with what the um, early childhood, early intervention pathway through the NDIS. And just a point on that, of course, the NDIS is going through growing pains, um, but we absolutely know how powerful the NDIS will be to create change in our community. So hang with it and support it as it goes along um, and of course fight your corner as well. Um, uh, certainly intervention does not cease at that point. My personal view is that um, uh, absolutely um, uh, clinical contact um, with um, community clinicians needs to continue to occur of course depending upon um, the particular child but again the biggest focus has to be upon how we can support kids within schools. Um, uh, there's no use um, uh, uh, focusing purely on a child within a clinic. A child needs to function within their environment and schools are such a massive ally who are doing their absolute best. And I know some of the reforms around Australia, WA in particular, has been um, remarkable in that regard, regard. So we do need to um, work with schools to develop interventions to help them support themselves. Where can we find more information about Jasper um, as articles? Please contact us and we'll provide you as much information, including the scholarly articles um, as well. Um, uh, okay, this, this is a curly one. So what is the purpose of infant and in utero interventions? It sounds like the goal is to change children to make them less autistic. Um, I, I, um, I, I absolutely appreciate that point. It's certainly by absolutely no means that's the case. Um, the goal of intervention, um, and I hope that um, people have heard me say this on multiple occasions, um, the goal of intervention for me is not to ameliorate autism from the gene pool, absolutely not, and I just want to say that openly and categorically. People on the spectrum um, have contributed to our community and society um, forever and they will continue to do so. Um, and my life personally has been enriched enormously um, by these interactions um, and these friendships. However, there are some things that often come along with autism, such as intellectual disability or communication difficulties that aren't choices, that aren't um, uh, advantageous to that child to help them make their own choices in their own lives. So when I talk about intervention, it's not about making people less autistic, it's actually about helping people um, lower the disability that they may experience in their life um, so they can actually promote and shine about who they are. And that's really the focus is reducing the disability associated with autism. What training do you offer clinicians? Um, we can absolutely provide you some more information on that. Please do get in contact. There's a lot of training we offer and we'd love to um, talk to you about that. Um, 
Question, next question. Um, how come it takes so long to diagnose um, a, a child on the spectrum? I know schools struggle to teach without the support once a child is diagnosed. Yeah, it's a really great question. There are many, many different answers for that. Um, and and um, um, I can go into them at length. I think probably the most important thing that I would want to say right now is that the NDIS, um, I've, I've, uh, I've spoken about the importance of the National Gui uh, Guideline of Diagnosis, and that is important because diagnosis remains such an important part in the clinical process, not just for clinical management, but in understanding, everyone's understanding. Um, uh, what the, the, the wonderful reform that the NDIS um, has brought in is that um, support is apportioned based on needs, functional needs, rather than the presence or absence of a diagnosis. I certainly understand that at times that might not seem the case on the ground, but certainly that's what's in the Legislative Act. And the, the more that we can reduce the emphasis on diagnosis in the clinical pathway, I think the better families will be, the more seamless the clinical pathways can be, um, and the better um, um, kids um, can grow up to happy and healthy kids. Um, okay. Uh, I was wondering, could you comment on the increase um, in IVF, potentially increasing the number of kids um, presenting with autism? That's a really important question. Um, um, uh, and, and thank you for asking that. I actually do know the answer to this. Um, um, and the answer is there is no evidence that IVF um, um, increases the chances um, of a child um, being diagnosed, or an offspring being diagnosed with autism. There is no evidence um, for that. Um, and so I, I can um, say that quite clearly right up front. Um, is there research on which intervention is best for kids with autism and intellectual disability versus kids with autism who don't have intellectual disability? Um, no, um, th th there is some um, research and, and, and particularly I know that there are some colleagues on this call right now, um, uh, I think of David Trembath over in um, Brisbane who have made tremendous advances in our use of alternative and augmentative communication. Um, that, of course, not conflating intellectual disability with communication difficulties, but certainly we know there are aspects of our interventions that are more suited to people with um, uh, an associated intellectual disability. But again, that PATH study that I mentioned, that'll be one of the key outcomes of that study, is which of these particular interventions might be more effective for kids um, who do have a developmental um, or global developmental delay or intellectual disability. Um, Oh, here's, here's a nice question. Um, so is it true that kids on the, the spectrum um, also have uh, an extraordinary ability in specific areas? That's really interesting. And that probably could go back to our 1980s category because certainly that was one of the things that people knew um, about autism in the 1980s. Of course, entirely driven by Rain Man. Um, what we do know is that um, um, the so-called savant abilities is, is really not a great feature um, of, of autism in general, um, um, but um, we do see um, certain abilities in some kids um, uh, uh, on, on the spectrum and adults on the spectrum where there are these phenomenal cognitive abilities in one area, memory or drawing or one aspect, but certainly that's a minority. Um, what I encourage everyone to focus on though is the extraordinary personality attributes that everyone brings and and that's for all of us of course but we're talking about autism here but what i'd really focus on is some of the kindness that we see um, amongst um, the autistic community that we interact with um, some of the extraordinary uh, um, uh, acts of intelligence or insight that we get that's what i'd really encourage you to focus on um, do we have information on autism assessment via telehealth? It's a really great um, question. Certainly COVID has brought to the fore um, information uh, uh, diagnosed can autism be diagnosed um, um, exclusively via telehealth. Um, prior to COVID, I would say no, <laughs> but in the diagnostic guideline, we do put a clause that um, unless um, through extraordinary circumstances, um, it shouldn't um, be diagnosed, autism shouldn't be diagnosed via telehealth, but absolutely there are extraordinary circumstances we see now. And I absolutely understand the ethical um, uh, imperative to ensure swift access to diagnosis. So um, uh, uh, no, I don't, but I know that there there are several um, uh, prominent researchers around Australia who are very interested in, in diagnosis via telehealth and we would love to join that research effort as well. Um, okay.
Is there training currently available for clinicians in PACT or JASPER? Um, that's a really good question. And um, currently we're, we're um, the only body that has provided in Australia um, a PACT um, and JASPER training. And we certainly hope to do that again into the future. So I'd really encourage you to um, get onto our mailing list and we'll let you know when that's the case. Um, and we'll look at innovative ways that we can do this um, should um, we all keep our borders shut for a little bit longer. That includes New Zealand, of course. Um, how can teachers support this study and how um, can the study support us to support our students? Um, well, let's uh, answer the second one um, um, first, because that's the most important thing to you is about how this research can work for you. Um, and the most important way that it can work for you is to provide some clear answers. I have no doubt that educators are like all of us working um, uh, clinically on the ground with autism, with autism is that we have a very good understanding about autism. We have a very good understanding about the science. What we don't have a good understanding is about how it marries up. How does the science apply to this student, in your case, in front of you? And that's what this study will do, is how can a particular child, for example, a child with intellectual disability or a child with language difficulties or a child um, with, um, uh, uh, you know, toileting troubles. How can um, um, a particular intervention approach um, support a child and which intervention approach might be most effective for that child? That's the information that um, that study will provide you. Um, how can you support us? We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to hear from your students um, for this study. Um, how do you differentiate the results you're getting as a result of a clinician compared to the intervention or results due to intervention versus normal development in that period? That's a fabulous question and this is the nub of science is that um, all we can do is the best that we can possibly do at the time. Um, uh, of course control groups, we have control groups within that um, and so we can understand that um, compared to uh, comparison therapy somebody might be improving, somebody might not be improving um, but um, the, the other way that we do it is that we, um, with regards to the clinician, we train clinicians to a certain standard and the standard that we train the clinicians to, of course, clinicians are absolutely bloody wonderful in Australia. We are so lucky to have the training that we have um, and so lucky to have the kind uh, mentality that our clinicians have. So we train them to a certain uh, level and that level we must um, uh, urge is then replicable for people within the community if they would like to. Um, if they would like to uh, replicate that. So we need to train them to a level that the community clinicians can um, uh, uh, then, then do as well. How effective is telehealth in working with kids um, on the spectrum? Um, and will it be considered in research in the future? Um, it's, a, it's a fabulous question and it's so funny how COVID, well, not so funny, it's, it's absolutely unsurprising that COVID has um, brought this to the fore. Look, one of the ways that we need to shake up the um, clinical pathway is the way that we deliver therapy. Um, we all know it um, and we haven't done it because it's bloody tough. Um, um, uh, is one-on-one -on -one intervention in the clinic um, effective? Absolutely. Is it the most effective for every family? No. Um, they, 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 it absolutely depends on the family circumstance at the time. Um, telehealth is not only a means in which we can see are there other mechanisms through which um, telehealth can be um, effective, but also can we reach families whose um, one, ac um, one access to the intervention might be only every now and then. So I think it has importance in terms of different delivery mechanism. It has importance in terms of access, um, but certainly on the gross level, we absolutely know. And again, out of Griffith University, um, I believe it was, um, there was a fabulous random uh, systematic review that showed that um, telehealth is certainly effective to uh, more effective than um, a child receiving no intervention and in many aspects is as effective as one-on-one -on -one therapy. Okay, so we've got a couple more um, questions because I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, so we'll go to, um, um, can it be challenging to differentiate autism from other diagnoses like complex trauma or FASD? Um, we, um, yeah, so it, it, yes, absolutely. Um, particularly in the early years of life. Um, remember when we're diagnosing autism, we're diagnosing a set of behaviours. Um, that, when it gets down to it, is what we're diagnosing. Such a key part of that, and again, enshrined in the um, diagnostic guidelines, excuse me, is the family history. And that for young kids um, is often 
a very big difference um, to help us understand um, what this child may be presenting with. Um, so for example, complex trauma, I'm certainly by no means an expert here, um, a complex trauma um, can often mimic autism or the, the similar autistic behaviours early in life. FASD, of course, as well, um, that's fetal alcohol spectrum. Um, um, uh, condition um, for those who don't know that. Um, and so this is where a really detailed family history comes um, into place. And again, um, just a, a shout out, um, um, there is diagnostic training um, that happens um, through clinics and of course through the University of Western Australia through the program, fabulous program they provide there. Um, so how would I recommend one goes about going down research as a career path? Um, and what kind of job titles are we looking at? Um, that's a really great question. Um, um, how do I recommend um, you do it? Number one, get the passion. Um, um, like every career, and I'm talking to the clinicians, I'm talking to um, families and whatever career you might be in, I'm talking about parenthood, um, is that there is so much that can knock you off this path. I often think, um, uh, all of us in a career are hanging onto a tree and there is something um, down below that's shaking the trunk as vigorously as possible and people fall off one by the other. And the only thing that keeps you holding on is passion. So number one, have that passion. And number two, um, and contact um, uh, someone within a local university um, um, or a local medical research institute or somebody that you admire and get in contact with them and help and, and, and um, uh, ask them which ways you can do. If they're worth their salt, they'll respond to you and they'll certainly nurture you um, along the way. So passion and then everything else is a bit of a doddle, to be quite frank. Okay. Um, I think there might be one more question in here. Uh, I'll go right up. Um, about the DSM-5 criteria for autism, what about issues of incomplete criteria in diagnosis, like just two subdomains in social communication? I'm not too sure I understand the full thrust of the questions, but just to, understand, to, to help people understand um, what um, uh, we do as diagnosticians. Um, is uh, there is every 10 or 20 years, there's a manual that's put out, and all you will know, and, and, and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, and um, in that manual, there's a list of behaviours um, that we use to diagnose um, autism um, and many other conditions. Um, um, what we certainly um, do every 10 to 20 years is that those um, behavioural criteria are updated. And the latest um, um, version, the fifth version, so DSM-5, um, really changed um, the way that we diagnose autism from that triad of behaviours I mentioned before to the dyad. And it really has a significant impact on the ground about which kids um, get diagnosed. Um, my, my own view of DSM-5 is was that it was a, um, a really impressive um, um, uh, a reform, and there were some real much needed reforms there, particularly the recognition of sensory differences. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. And um, it certainly needs improvement, and that will happen um, in the future versions, but certainly it, I, I believe that there was a, a positive development. Right, that's uh, enough for me now. Um, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to throw back to Keisha, but just before I do that, I want to thank you for your time today. An hour out of your diary. Um, is really diffi uh, difficult, I know, particularly when I know there are um, episodes of Tiger King on Netflix waiting for you, um, but I really want to uh, um, thank you for your time. Um, if you have any questions, please get in contact with us. We'd love to hear from you. I personally would love to hear from you as well. Thank you again and over to Keisha. Thank you so much, Andrew. I always walk away from your presentations feeling excited about the passion that you bring to the to the field and I can tell by the questions that we got tonight really engaging interesting questions that a lot of people are feeling the same I just wanted to say a huge thank you to you all for joining us tonight it's 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 a big ask an hour of, of your time and we really appreciate it if you've enjoyed tonight's webinar um, please feel free to join us for our next webinar which will be on the 27th of May and we'll cover some of the therapies um, in the early intervention space that are available here at Clinikids. Um, once again thank you so much for joining us if you'd like to ask a question or get in contact um, please use the contact details on your screen now and we hope to be speaking with you soon